Uh, she also directs the Department of Energy EFRC on synthetic control across link scales for advancing rechargeables or scalar. So please join me in welcoming Sarah to give today's colloquium. Thank you. Okay, so is this mic working? Sounds really loud, like it's working too much. Is this okay? Not too loud? Okay, all right, so it's a pleasure to be here and to have an opportunity to talk to you about some of the research going on in my group. Um, as I hope that introduction made clear, we do a lot of different things uh, that are united by trying to control nanoscale architecture as a way to tune materials properties. And we do a lot of synchrotron work, not very much of it here, but I've been convinced, I, I have been told multiple times, once you try 100 KeV, you'll like it. You'll want to come back. So um, we have a lot of ideas from all the people we've talked to today, and hopefully we will be back. But today I'm going to talk to you about a variety of projects from my group that are focused on two topics, next generation batteries and multi oak materials. And sort of the first three quarters is going to be batteries, and then we'll change gears and start talking about nanomagnetics. Um, I know that there's a lot of really exciting battery research that is going on here, but for those of you who are not battery researchers, let me start out with the super fast tutorial to how to think about a battery, because if you don't have this, none of it's going to make sense. So pretty much every one of us has a lithium ion battery in our pocket, and pretty much every one of us is at some point in their life frustrated with the lithium ion battery that you have in your pocket. And so our goal is to first think about how they made, are made and how they function, and then to think about what we could do to solve those things that cause us angst. So if we look at a battery, um, whether they are a cylindrical cell or a flat cell, fundamentally they're just made of layers of things. And those are a layer of cathode, a layer of anode, and a layer of a porous separator that is just designed to keep the anode layer and the cathode layer from touching. And then that anode layer and cathode layer are then generally made up of layered materials. So in most commercial lithium ion batteries, the anode is made up of graphite, which is layered carbon, and the cathode is made up of a layered transition metal oxide. And in a secondary ion battery, the idea is that the only thing that moves or does chemical reactions is lithium, which shuttles back and forth. So in the cathode, that's where the lithium wants to sit, that's the stable phase. So to charge a battery, what we do is we drive lithium out from between the layers in the cathode, and we force it to go between the layers of the anode. If we then let the system relax or discharge, we let that lithium move out from between the layers, and since lithium is positively charged, an electron must accompany it. That electron does work for us, and the lithium diffuses from the anode layer back between the cathode layers. And this is the process of charging and discharging. And if you ask, what is the slowest step in this process? It is not the long range motion of lithium through the liquid electrolyte from the anode to cathode, but it is the solid state of diff diffusion of lithium between the layers of either the anode or the cathode material to get the lithium in when charging and to get the lithium out when discharging. And so that solid state diffusion and those uh, time limitations is what we're gonna focus on first asking how we can use nanoscale materials to help alleviate some of the slowness of battery charging. Okay, so if we think about batteries, people generally draw what is called a Rigoni plot, where you plot energy density, that is energy per mass on one axis, and power density, that is energy per mass per time on the other axis. And by the way, they switch X and Y randomly, so don't get in love with this picture. So what you see is that a battery has fairly high energy density, not as high as fossil fuels, but fairly high. Um, but it is very slow because of that solid state diffusion of lithium ions. Parallel plate capacitors are super fast, nothing's moving but an electron, but the energy density is quite low. And there's a need for something that bridges the gap, and that something is called supercapacitors. Um, and so you could compromise between the speed and the capacity of a battery, but that's not really what we want. What we actually want is a battery that is faster. So we'd like to keep all of the capacity of a battery and speed it up. So in order to do that, we need to start out by understanding what is a supercapacitor and why is there normally a compromise. So when most people say supercapacitor, what they're actually referring to is something called an electric double layer capacitor, 
which is generally made out of high surface area carbon. You charge up the surface of the conductive carbon and you balance that charge by an ion in solution. And so you make what is really a little parallel plate capacitor at the interface between the solid and the liquid. And so it should be called a capacitor and it behaves in many ways the same as a parallel plate capacitor. What we are going to talk about today is something called a pseudo capacitor. And pseudo is now the active word because the distinction between a battery and a pseudo capacitor is much less clear. So what does this system consist of? It's a, for cathodes, a transition metal oxide that is the exact same material as a battery material. And in that pseudo capacitor, we are going to do the exact same redox chemistry that we do in a traditional battery material. That is, we might do redox on a transition metal, take a lithium ion, make a tight ion pair with that uh, reduced transition metal in the exact same uh, way that you do in a battery. But we're going to do that at the surface or in the near surface regime of a material. And so as a surface phenomena, it becomes similar to a double layer capacitor, but it is a redox based system. So in this material, electrostatic repulsion between these ions is what limits the total capacity. But in this system, we're making neutral ion pairs. And so what limits the capacity is just like in a battery, which is the density of redox active ions. But we now have a complex problem, which is to ask, how do we define surface redox? Is it the outer one atom layer? Is it the outer one nanometer? Maybe 10 nanometers. Maybe surface could be 100 nanometers. How do we define where a pseudo capacitor stops and where a battery begins? And the challenge with this is if you want to design new fast charging systems, you have to actually understand what pseudo capacitance is. And then our second challenge is to say, if it is the exact same chemistry as a battery, how do we even measure the difference between pseudo capacitance and battery like intercalation? So it turns out that the second one of those questions is easier than the first, and that's going to let us get towards the answer to the first question. So if the, oh, sorry, if the only thing that's different between a battery and a pseudo capacitor is the kinetics, then we're going to use a kinetic definition to distinguish between pseudo capacitance and batteries. So anybody here who does electrochemistry knows that if you take CV curves at different sweep rates, that the current that you measure will vary with sweep rate. And if you go to the simple diffusion equations, what you predict is that for any diffusion controlled process, the current that you measure at any given voltage will vary as the square root of the sweep rate. That just comes straight out of simple diffusion equations. And so we will say anything that is diffusion controlled as identified by the fact that the current has a, sweep, a square root of sweep rate dependence, we will call all those diffusion controlled processes intercalation. But if you take the classic capacitor equations and you transform them to the differential form of a CV curve, you actually come out with the fact that the current should vary linearly with the sweep rate. And so we can make the simple hypothesis that the current you measure will have some component that has a linear sweep rate dependence and some component that has a square root of sweep rate dependence. And if we just divide through by square root of sweep rate, we can linearize this equation and we can pull out these K1 and K2 constants from the slope and the intercept of a graph like this. Um, and I should mention that Bruce Dunn in material science at UCLA is my partner in crime in this pseudo capacitor work and really pioneered this kinetic analysis. Okay, so once you have these constants at any given sweep rate, you can take a CV curve and you can say, okay, at this potential, 100% of the current that I measured was capacitive, and at this current, 50% of the current that I measured was capacitive, and 50% was uh, diffusion controlled. Oops. 50% was capacitive, 50% was diffusion controlled, white is diffusion controlled here. Or you could integrate over the whole CV curve and just say, okay, on average, this was the capacitive fraction. And in this work on monolayers of titanium dioxide nanocrystals, titania can serve as an anode, it's not a great anode, you find that when the nanocrystals get to be less than 10 nanometers in diameter, they're about half capacitive. And if you do some very simple volume of a sphere calculations, what you determine is that the outer two nanometers of these nanocrystals are behaving in a capacitive fraction. And that feels okay for surface. Two nanometers seems like a process that could be not diffusion controlled in an electrochemical experiment. 
Okay, so what's the problem? That's a monolayer of nanocrystals, and that doesn't make a very big battery in terms of total capacity. If you now make a thick film of nanoparticles, and when I say thick, this is like 300 nanometers thick, so not really thick. What you find is it's still half capacitive, but the total capacity goes down because the electrolyte is not accessing all the surfaces of those nanocrystals. So the first thing that we need in order to make a practical pseudocapacitor is an architecture where we can have access to all those surface redox sites. And this is one of the things that my group loves to do, <coughs> which is putting holes in things. So when we say what is the ideal architecture for a pseudocapacitor, many years of work has given us the following definition. So what do we need? We need high surface area, so we have lots of those surface redox reactions. But we need a porous network so that the electrolyte can access all of that surface area. And then the battery community decided a long time ago that nanoscale building blocks themselves stink as batteries because the electrical resistance is too high. And so we need to assemble those nanoparticles into an interconnected grain so that we can get electrical conductivity through the entire network. So, um, Making holy things is one of the things that we love to do, and in fact, everything I'm gonna talk to you about today is going to be a holy version of something. Uh, and we use a variety of me methods to put holes in things. <coughs> so one of our favorite methods is to use block copolymer templating, where we take sol gel type precursors, we co-assemble them with amphiphilic di-block copolymers that make micelles. We also just make preformed colloids, polymer colloids. They work equally well. And we assemble those into a organic, inorganic composite. We can also start with preformed nanocrystals and again make an organic, inorganic composite. The molecular precursors tend to make more ordered things. The nanocrystals tend to make more disordered things. But sadly, for beautiful electron micrographs, disordered things make every bit as good batteries as ordered things. And so we don't make very many ordered things in my group anymore because it's a lot harder and it doesn't do us any good. Um, we can then remove the organic either by washing it out or just burning it out by calcination to create our nanoporous materials. Okay, so let's see if that works. Let's take those exact same titanium nanoparticles that I showed you before. These are examples of porous networks that are made from nanocrystals. Here's the individual nanocrystals you can see in the walls. And we can also make things from sol gel precursors where the walls are solid, made out of a uh, ti pure titanium network. And the surface area here is much lower than the surface area here. And by the way, this is disordered and this is ordered and they're identical as batteries, so the ordering doesn't buy us much. And if we now look at the electrochemistry, here's the data I showed you before, uh, monolayer of nanoparticles and thick films of nanoparticles. Here's the porous material with solid walls and it has a low capacitive fraction because it has a very low surface area. But if we make a nanoparticle-based film, it looks basically identical to the monolayer of nanocrystals. So you say, great, we have an architecture. Now let's start to ask that question, how thick is the pseudocapacitive layer? And so to do this, we made a porous material out of non-redox active nanoparticles. ITO is a conductive oxide. And then we conformally coated it with a thin film of vanadium pentoxide, which is a nice anode material. Well, it's actually sort of a lousy potential between anodes and cathodes, but it's a nice redox active material. And we can conformally coat our porous network. Um, and this is in collaboration with Gary Rubloff's group. So here we can see the uh, SEM image of our nice porous ITO network. It's disordered, but the porosity is homogeneous, and you can see all the nanoparticles. Here we can formally coat it with two nanometers and seven nanometers of vanadia. And we said, okay, I got it. This will be a pseudocapacitor, and this will be a battery. And skipping all the data, we can do the electrochemical kinetics, and indeed we find this is dominantly a pseudocapacitor, and we find that this is also a pseudocapacitor. And this means that that pseudocapacitive link scale is not the same in all materials, and we need to figure out how to define that link scale. More importantly, if a seven nanometer layer is dominantly capacitive, and you imagine going in from both sides, that's a 15 nanometer nanoscale object. Now you have the potential to fully cycle a nanoscale object in a manner that appears capacitive. And this leads us to a concept that has been called in the literature intercalation pseudocapacitance. And we did not coin this term, Conway coined this term when he defined pseudocapacitance very early on. But this term pisses people off because pseudocapacitance and intercalation should not appear in the same sentence and definitely not right next to each other. So how are we using this term? We're using it to describe a system where we can cycle almost the full capacity of a nanostructured material 
where we think we have very well-defined redox sites, but kinetically it appears capacitive. So the first system where we saw this is a moly trioxide. We made beautiful ordered porous things with thick walls, 20, 30 nanometer thick walls. And to our surprise, we found that it was dominantly capacitive, even though we didn't expect that with the th high wall thickness. Our favorite pseudo-capacitive system is niobium pentoxide, which is an amazing material. Here's a beautiful ordered porous material, but you can also make the ugliest not ordered porous material, and it is almost always entirely pseudo-capacitive. In fact, it's basically entirely pseudo-capacitive to over 100 nanometers in domain size, and that's probably not surface in most people's book. And so the question is, why is niobia so capacitive? And so one of our theorist friends said, I will explain niobium pentoxide to you. The crystal structure of niobia is a little bit weird. If you look at the overall structure, niobium only occupies, I think it's two thirds of the lattice sites, and the other third of the lattice sites are just empty. And lithium can go sit in those sites. And then if you look at the barrier to hopping between sites, it's super low. So you say, oh, so lithium can just zip through this material. So maybe intercalation pseudocapacitance is just governed by a balance between lithium diffusion rate and total diffusion distance. And every material has a pseudocapacitive length scale, and it may be 100 nanometers in niobia and 2 nanometers in titania and everything in between in a range of other materials. But there's a complexity here. When you put lithium into this structure, it sits in an empty lattice site. Um, and so the structure doesn't need to rearrange. But in most battery materials, the crystal structure without lithium and with lithium are different. And in order to get a phase transition, you need to nucleate a new phase, and then that new phase needs to propagate. That two-phase coexistence is what pins the potential of a battery at a single voltage and what gives you a single voltage in a battery system. Um, and this kind of nucleation and growth is by definition diffusion controlled. So if this is happening, it's a battery. But we had examples of systems that showed really fast kinetics where we knew the bulk systems had phase transitions. And so perhaps the answer is the rest of the definition of a pseudocapacitor is that you somehow need to not have those bulk phase transitions in nanoscale materials. So we went looking. Um, so the first system we looked at was moly dioxide. We chose this because it's a reduced oxide that happens to be a metallic conductor. So conductivity wasn't an issue because that always sneaks in once you fix everything else. And we can make beautiful nanoporous versions of moly dioxide and we can buy micron sized powders. And when you do the electrochemical kinetics, you find that indeed the nanoporous versions are dominantly capacitive and the microscopic versions are dominantly diffusion controlled. And then you can look at um, structural changes with charging. And what you see in the bulk is that there is a clear intercalation-induced phase transition. And as you uh, uh, take the lithium back out, there's a clear lithium extraction-induced phase transition. And if you look at the nanoscale system, you have the exact same capacity. You're putting all the same lithium in. In fact, you have slightly higher capacity because you have some extra surface sites. Um, but there's no phase transition. And if you think, oh, these peaks are broad, maybe it's happening and you just can't see it, the phase transition is not happening in the nanostructured material. And so this leads us to a new set of hypothesis for a definition of pseudocapacitance, which is to say, how do you design a pseudocapacitor? Porosity for solvent diffusion, nanosized building blocks for short diffusion links, um, high ion diffusion constants, and these two have to be matched based on how high it is and how fast, how far it has to go. And then somehow a structure that either doesn't need a phase transition or where the phase transition is suppressed um, upon lithium intercalation. And then, by the way, high electrical conductivity. So we said, okay, let's see if this is a functional definition for what is a pseudocapacitor. So we said, let's design a new material that we think will be a pseudocapacitor. So I don't know how to design this one yet, but I do know how to design this one. And that is to say, if you want fast ion diffusion, what you should do is weaken the interaction between the lithium ion and the host. So lithium is a hard cation. Oxygen is a hard anion, so they have a strong interaction. If you go to a softer anion, you can potentially weaken that interaction. 
So let's just go from lithium, from oxygen to sulfur. Um, and we are technically a physical chemistry group, and so we're not going to do some really weird sulfur chemistry. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to make beautiful oxide materials, and then we're going to heat the snot out of them in hydrogen sulfide gas. And you can get complete replacement of oxygen for sulfur with retention of nanoscale periodicity. So this is small angle scattery, scattering. This is GSAC scattering off the pore system. And what you see is, although it's a little more disordered, the GSAC is in the exact same place. The pores look smaller because the molysulfide is actually less dense than the molyoxide. And so you, the walls expand a little and the pores shrink a little bit. Um, we can make thin film systems like this, and we can also make nanoparticles. And in the nanoparticles, you can do TM, and you can see how the poor molysulfide layers have to squish themselves into their new nano-sized space in any way that they can, but they maintain the bulk molysulfide crystal structure. And then the nanoparticles can be assembled into nanoporous networks. So if we look at these materials, oh, sorry, there's a confusion. Anybody here who does multi-layer, single-layer 2D conductors knows that molysulfide is a semiconductor, and I told you that we really like metals because conductivity is a problem. And luckily for us, that is not a problem because when you intercalate lithium into semiconducting, which is um, 2H phase molysulfide, it undergoes an irreversible phase transition from the 2H phase to the 1T phase. And this phase transition is slow, it's diffusion controlled, it's everything that a phase transition should be, except that it is irreversible. So we slowly pre-cycle our systems to completely drive them from the 2H to the 1T phase, and then we do all of our electrochemistry in the 1T metallic phase, so that the electrical conductivity is not an issue in these materials. Okay, so when we do this, what we find is these systems are crazy fast. So um, we can get 100 milliamp hours per gram in 100 C. If you don't think in C rates, 1 C means complete charge in an hour. The number is then a fraction, so uh, uh, 10 C is a tenth of an hour or six minutes, and 100 C is 36 seconds. And so that's a lot of charge in a short amount of time. You really can't go faster because at that point, you're already being limited by liquid phase ion diffusion as opposed to the solid state. And the liquid phase ion diffusion you'll never get rid of if it's a liquid state battery. And so if you're asking when we say diffusion controlled what sets our time scale, it's the time scale before the liquid state diffusion starts to be the rate limiting step. Okay, so these systems are super fast. Um, they're dominantly capacitive. And they also show incredible stability. So batteries, I don't know how long your cell phone battery usually lasts two years, charged once a day, that's 600 cycles and it's starting to really decay. These are 10,000 cycles with almost no capacity fade. Okay, so here's a question for the audience. Why does your cell phone battery die with time? What's, what are the things that kill your battery? Come on, wake up. Nobody can answer. Huh? Um, Yes, basically. So there are some side reactions, but the biggest thing is repeated phase transitions basically break up the grains and break up all the electrical conductivity. So repeated phase transitions in a normal battery system are what is at the root of a lot of the capacity fade. So when I look at 10,000 cycles, I say there must be no phase transitions in this system. So, okay, what do we do? We are cheap and don't want to get on an airplane, so we get in a car and we drive up to the Stanford synchrotron, and we take and make a coin cell. We either make pouch cells or we make uh, coin cells with uh, Kapton windows, and then we take and we do diffraction as we cycle our material. And in the micron scale molysulfide, what you see is that as you intercalate lithium, you see a shift in this peak and a new peak appearing, which is a symmetry baking phase transition. As you take the lithium out, you see the second peak disappear and you see the shift reverse. And if you look at the nanoscale material, it doesn't do anything. So there's basically no structural change in the nanoscale version. Okay, so how do we make things harder for molysulfide? Let's go from lithium to sodium. 
because sodium is a lot bigger than lithium. And it turns out that even with sodium, the material is dominantly capacitive. And so here's the analysis I showed you before where we assume a sum of a sweep rate to the first power and a sweep rate to the one half power dependence and we just decompose the data into both and we find it's almost entirely capacitive. Here's a different analysis, it's called the Trasadi analysis where you just extrapolate to infinite sweep rate and call the infinite sweep rate capacity the capacitive fraction and you get very similar numbers and they are both extremely capacitive. Now in the bulk, um, molysulfide actually shows two phase transitions when cycled with sodium in a process called staging. You put in half the sodium and it undergoes one phase transition, and then you put in the other half of the sodium and it undergoes a second phase transition. So we can again uh, go to the synchrotron and when we look at bulk, indeed we see this staging process. So here's the first phase transition where these two peaks join and this peak shifts. Here's the second phase transition where this peak splits then we reverse the second phase transition and we reverse the first phase transition and we see hysteresis in the peak position. Okay, so we see classic behavior when we cycle bulk molysulfide with sodium. When we go to our nanoscale material, we see some small shifts in peak position but we see no symmetry breaking and no hysteresis. And so basically we see suppression of phase transitions with sodium as well as with lithium. So you can ask how we are doing and the answer is quite literally outside the box. Because we're cycling the full capacity of these materials, we have to have the full capacity of a battery system. But because we're cycling so much faster, we have supercapacitor like power densities combined with battery like energy densities. So you might say, great, go start a company, make my cell phone battery charge in three minutes, make it so I can charge my electric car in three minutes. And the answer is, these are all anodes. <laughs> and in order to make a battery, we need some cathodes. So it turns out that cathodes are harder than anodes because cathodes are the material that are stable with lithium already in it. And in general, to get all the cations to order properly, you have to heat them to very high temperature. And when you heat nanoscale materials to very high temperatures, you often destroy those nanoscale materials. And so keeping good nanoscale porosity um, in cathodes is not as easy. But there are some materials that we can look at. And one that is particularly useful is lithium manganese oxide. It's not the greatest cathode material, but it crystallizes at a pleasantly lukewarm 480 degrees C. And so it's very easy to create nanoporous materials where we keep na nice nanoscale porosity. And so we can make nanoporous LMO and we can cycle it. And indeed we find it is dominantly capacitive and that you, you lose very little capacity as you sweep faster. But you might notice, if you are paying attention, that the values on the y-axis here are a lot smaller than the values on the y-axis were before. And that is because of a known problem with lithium manganese oxide, which is that the surface is inactive. Basically the manganese three on the surface spontaneously disproportionates into manganese two and manganese four. And then the manganese two can go and sit in the lithium site and it makes the surface inactive because now there's no lithium that can cycle in and out. So I said to my student, I said, we need small, but not too small. And this student was perhaps not the most excited about doing a lot of detailed chemistry. And so what he did is he took his beautiful, absolutely homogeneous, templated 10 nanometer domain side nanoporous material and he threw it in the oven at 700 degrees C for one minute and he coarsened all the domains to about 20 nanometers. And then he threw it in the oven at 800 degrees C and coarsened all the domains to about 40 nanometers and then 900 degrees and coarsened it up to about 70 nanometers. So these are not the most homogeneous samples but they do have porosity and they do have an increasing average domain size. And then we can start to look at how the electrochemistry varies with the domains in the walls of these porous networks. So here's our 10, 20, 40, and 70. And what you see is that indeed the slow sweep rate capacity goes steadily up as you make the material bigger. As you go to higher sweep rate, things start to cross and it's a little hard to follow. So it's easier if we just normalize them to the 5C capacity. And what we see is remarkably the 10, 20, and 40 nanometer samples show the exact same change in capacity as a function of C rate, whereas the 70 nanometer fades much, much faster. So you might say, huh, maybe these are one thing and this is something else. Um, we can then do kinetics and we find that indeed the smaller ones are dominantly capacitive, 
while the larger ones are much more diffusion controlled. And if we look at uh, cycle lifetime, we find that the small ones have a long stable cycle life and the small ones, uh, the bigger ones have a much faster decay. And then finally, we can go to the synchrotron and look at structural change. And in this case, the peaks are not nearly as well um, separated. But what we find is that in the large size materials, we do see some solid solution type behavior in terms of we see continuous shifting of the peaks. But we also see a discontinuous phase transition. You cannot fit this data with single width unless you put in two phase coexistence corresponding to a phase transition, whereas smaller materials, you can easily fit the entire range of potentials with a single peak width, and the overall extent of change is much, much smaller in the small materials than in the large materials, even though the capacity is almost identical for these two materials. And so fundamentally, the small ones do not show a phase transition, while the large ones do. And so what we see is crossover from a pseudocapacitor to a battery in a single material. So at this point, I think we finally understand what defines a pseudocapacitor. The question that we are currently focusing on is why, is phase, why are phase transitions suppressed in these nanoscale materials and how do we design that in and how do we determine the crossover point from being a battery to a pseudocapacitor? Okay, so we said that's great, but we need more cathodes. And we're working on a bunch of them, and I can tell you synthetically they're a pain in the butt because you make beautiful nanoporous things, and then by the time they crystallize, they're not beautiful nanoporous things. But one thing that we did is we said, what is one of the fastest battery systems? So the metal phosphates, so like lithium iron phosphate, is an extremely fast battery system. So we said, actually, so let's look at some of these phosphate systems. And a system that was reported to be particularly fast is um, vanadium phosphate, and particularly the fluorophosphates have higher potentials than the oxyphosphates. And so we said, let's look at lithium vanadium fluorophosphate, LVPF, as an interesting model, high, a high potential, very fast system. So this is almost always made by solid state methods, and we developed a method to create nanoporous versions using polymer templating. You usually need a, a fluorine source, and we actually put the fluorine into our polymer template as a way to get our fluorophosphate and our porosity all at the same time. We can make nice homogeneous nanoporous things. You can see in this cut where some of the original colored templates were. It's crystallographically phase pure. Um, it has a reasonably high surface area. And electrochemically, it is blazingly fast. So in this system, we can see for a cathode, over 100 milliamp hours per gram capacity at 30 C. And although I showed you that for molysulfide, cathodes always have lower capacity than anodes. And so this is really fast for a cathode material. If you look at the data, however, it looks like it shows plateaus. And I told you before that when you see plateaus in electrochemistry, that's because you have two-phase coexistence with nucleation and growth, and the potential is pinned at the equilibrium, just like the temperature of an ice water solution is pinned at zero degrees until all of the ice melts. And so the fact that you see these plateaus suggests that, indeed, there is a phase transition in this material. And um, we get quite stable charging over uh, you know, thousands of cycles with good Coulomb efficiency. But if we go, um, oh, and then, but then if we say, let's do a kinetic analysis and see if this is behaving as a battery or a pseudocapacitor. So before I told you we take, and we say that the current has two terms, one that varies as sweep rate to the first power, one that varies as sweep rate to the one half power. What is easier to do is actually just say, eh, current varies as sweep rate to some power, we'll do a power law fit and just see what that power comes out to be. And it should always be a number between 0.5 and 1. And if it's 1, it's dominantly capacitive. And if it's 0.5, it's dominantly diffusion controlled. And when you do this experiment, you find that for all the redox peaks, this material is dominantly diffusion controlled. So this looks like a battery-like system. And indeed, if you go to the synchrotron and you do an in-situ diffraction experiment, you see clear signatures of two-phase coexistence. Um, you see a peak here that disappears, you see a peak here that appears, then it disappears, then this peak comes back in. And so you have symmetry breaking phase transitions in this material. And so fundamentally, nanoporous LVPF is a battery and not a pseudocapacitor. But it is blazingly fast. 
So the question is, why is it so fast? And we don't fully know the answer to this story, but I will tell you our speculation, which I think is going to lead us to eventual understanding of these systems, which is LVPF is a tunnel structure material, and if you look at the lithiated and the non-lithiated phases, the tunnels are open in both cases. And so in this material, lithium ion diffusion does not necessarily depend on the phase transition. So while the phase transition occurs, it is not limiting the ability of the lithium to get in and out of the system. And I think that our understanding of these very fast charging battery systems may lie in understanding the details of lithium diffusion as it is decoupled from the phase behavior in these materials. So regardless, from a practical point of view, LVPF is a great cathode, and it can be paired with our favorite pseudo-capacitive anode, niobium pentoxide. And in these systems, you can indeed make extremely fast-charging, asymmetric pseudo-capacitor batteries, which are half a battery, half a pseudo-capacitor, and extraordinarily fast. So from a technological point of view, it's exciting. From a fundamental point of view, we still have some understanding to go. Okay, mini conclusions number one, and this was by far the longest one. They're going to get shorter after this. Um, nanopore pseudocapacitors with optimized structures can be produced um, with high capacity and good um, high rate capabilities and good capacity. We can make anodes and cathodes. Suppression of phase transitions, which is very much a synchrotron related topic, is at the root of what is pseudocapacitance. And just to point out, not all fast charging systems are pseudocapacitors, and the literature is full of horrible papers that say it's fast. It must be a pseudocapacitor, even if it has like, uh, absolutely has to be a phase transition, like it's a conversion reaction. So beware of the literature, and this is something that we really do need to understand more if we want to design these systems. Okay, I'm gonna change gears now and talk about a different battery problem. And this battery problem is going to relate to ways to facilitate stability in high capacity anode materials. And we're gonna again use holes, because I love to put holes in things, but we're gonna make the holes in a different way. In this case, we're gonna make a new way to make porous materials by selective de-alloying. So some of you may be familiar with nanoporous gold. Nanoporous gold is made by taking a gold-silver alloy, just like my wedding ring, and dumping it into concentrated acid, which I will not do, and dissolving the silver out of that gold-silver alloy. They're homogeneously mixed in the alloy, but as the silver gets pulled out, the gold aggregates together and makes these very homogeneous nanoporous networks. And this fine network and this coarse network were made from the exact same gold-silver alloy, where the difference is how fast you pull the silver out. If you pull it out fast, you get a fine network, if you pull it down slowly, the gold has time to aggregate into a bigger network. This is beautiful, super easy chemistry, a great way to make nanoporous materials. Nanoporous gold is not actually good for anything to do with battery because it is far too expensive. Um, but there are materials that are more interesting. And in particular, in the world of high capacity anodes, graphite is what everybody uses, but silicon and tin are being widely explored because their capacities are way higher than graphite. So silicon is better than tin on a mass normalized basis, but on a volume normalized basis, which is what really matters, silicon and tin are exactly the same. We're gonna use tin because it is much easier for us to de-alloy. What's the problem? Well, when you lithiate graphite, there's almost no volume expansion. When you lithiate silicon or tin, there's a giant volume expansion. And this volume expansion means that if you have a bulk grain of silicon or tin, as you lithiate it, the whole thing will crack and it will expand, and in general what happens is it loses mechanical contact with the current collector, and so you end up with orphan grains that no longer cycle. And so the capacity fades very quickly. Our idea is to say, let's make it nanoporous and see if we can expand into the pores rather than expanding the entire grain. Um, Okay, so why is this interesting? Well, so going back to our whole templating method, we did some studies a while ago looking at silicon silica, just you know, the most boring oxide, silica, and we just put them on polymer substrates as porous materials and we stretch them. And what we found is when you make a material porous, you can uh, decrease the tensile modulus by an order of magnitude and increase the failure strain by an order of magnitude. So you can take silica glass and make it elastic and much harder to fracture just by putting pores into it. And that seemed nice for an uh, alloy anode that has a very large volume expansion. 
So we make our porous tin by making a magnesium tin alloy and etching the magnesium out of the tin. When we do this, we actually get a very weird structure. It's a hierarchical structure that shows um, micron scale grains that are made up of sort of hundreds of nanometer scale pores, but then each of those grains are made up of sort of 10 nanometer scale pores. And so we have porosity across link scales, and it's basically made up of small colloidal building blocks that are hierarchically aggregated. When we make this material, we find that it cycles very nicely. We see stable cycling across hundreds, not thousands, this is a battery, not a pseudocapacitor, um, but stable cycling across hundreds of cycles. Bulk tin dies in about less than 10 cycles, and reasonably fast rate capabilities, meaning we have reasonable capacity retention in 30 minutes, not 30 seconds, it's a battery, not a pseudocapacitor, but still much faster than a lot of group four alloy anodes. Um, structure does matter. We can make nanoporous tin that has a structure much more like that nanoporous gold, and we do this by basically having a slightly more oxidizing conditions here and less oxidizing here. And interesting, when we make this classic nanowire geometry, it doesn't cycle worth beans. And so the details of the nanoscale architecture are important. So we're going to focus on this more granular architecture. And the key thing that we want to do is understand what the architecture is doing to increase cycling stability. We do not want to just engineer a material, we want to understand the material. And to do this, we've turned to TIXM, Transmission X-ray Microscopy, uh, which we also do at the Stanford Synchrotron. And this is um, a new technique that we have fallen in love with because for the first time, we're not looking in reciprocal space, we're actually seeing things. Um, so the idea is that we make a pouch cell, um, we're using hard X-rays, now I feel funny saying that because you guys have really hard x-rays, and these are just wussy hard x-rays, but sort of hard x-rays, so that we can penetrate our pouch cell, we make a very low active mass loading, so at a 25%, with a goal of having single grains inside of our pouch cell. The data that I'm showing you here is all going to be 2D imaging in a pouch cell, but we are working on doing 3D tomography in a capillary cell, which is much harder, but I think we're making good progress on that. Um, so the beamline that we are using at Stanford has a spatial resolution down to about 30 nanometers, and that's small enough to see the pores in our nanoporous tin. So the first thing we can see is we can tell the difference between bulk tin and porous tin, and we can see the individual pores in our porous tin. And then we can start to ask, as we cycle these systems in situ, how does the overall grain shape change and how do the pores change? So the easier thing is just look at the overall grain. People have been doing that for a while because that doesn't require high resolution. And what you see for the bulk is as you go down in potential, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens until the lowest potentials where you get a burst of expansion and the material cracks. For the porous material, the volume changes over a much broader range and the overall expansion is much, much less. Okay? So it's more homogeneous and the overall extent of change is much smaller. It's also more reversible in the nanoscale material than in the bulk. So you say, it's great, you've made a great new anode material, but if you look a little more carefully at the pores themselves, what you see is here's the pore system before cycling, it's quite homogeneous. After you lithiate it, a bunch of the pores break. So the strain is still breaking pores on the small scale, and then when you delithiate it, a bunch of the pores go right back to the way they were, but you remain with some broken pores. So if you look at the average pore area, just by quantifying these into black and white images, you see that the average pore area increases because of those pores breaking to make big joined pores. So we said, okay, it's good, but it's not great. How do we make it better? Well, in the literature, what people do for bulk systems is they make um, mixed systems where you have two components that alloy at different potentials. And so, for example, one interesting system is to make an antimony tin alloy, because antimony and tin are both active, they both alloy with lithium. They don't have the exact same capacity, but they both have good capacities. And the potentials where the tin lithiates and where the antimony lithiates are different, and the idea is, ah, antimony will react at some potential and the lithium will stabilize the structure, tin will react at other potentials, and the antimony will stabilize the structure. So we can make porous antimony tin. We don't have a great picture because they're too thick. Um, but we can get reasonable cycling with reasonably good capacity retention in these porous antimony tin materials. And now when we go to do the TIXM experiment, what we see is that in terms of overall volume change, 
it's actually very similar to what we saw in tin. So here's the bulk tin that shows this burst expansion. Here's the antimony tin, which shows a slow increase in area across a range of potentials. And if we look at the aerial expansion, what we see is for both nanoporous antimony tin and nanoporous tin, they're very similar and they're both much lower expansion and more gradual expansion than the bulk tin system. And you could ask why we don't have bulk antimony tin, and I will tell you it is because we cannot get enough time on the Tixum line to run all of our controls. So uh, we would love to have many more control samples, but uh, you pick the most exciting things first. Okay, so there is something you notice, however, when you run the antimony tin, which is I didn't point this out, but in the tin, I put this circle around it, as these pores are breaking, the whole grain is actually sort of wiggling around because that pore breaking is straining the whole grain. If you look at the antimony tin, it's really stable across the range of potentials. And now if you go look at the pore system, here was that tin again with the pores that break. The antimony tin, the pores are literally shrinking. So you're, um, you are uh, expanding into the pore system. Uh-oh. Have run out of my own batteries. Nobody here happens to have a pointer, do they? <laughs> well, okay. We'll just point at the air, and maybe, maybe it will. Because it's a slow lithium-ion battery, maybe in time the ions will diffuse a little bit, and I'll get a little more charge out of it, which is what actually happens. Okay. So what you see in the antimony tin is that the pores are actually shrinking, and then they re-expand. And so if we look down here. In the tin, we see an expansion of the pore system, and in the antimony tin, we actually see a decrease. And when it dies, it really dies, which means it won't, um, it, which means it won't even click. So I'm going to have to stand over here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it charge for two seconds while I do this, so that maybe I can get it back for the rest of the talk. So I'm just going to put it on its little charger for three seconds and push it on my computer and we'll see if we can save it a little bit. Where is the hole that you put it into? Oh. Okay, let's see. At the very least, I should be able to uh, advance. Well, I'm standing by my computer. I don't need to advance it. Okay. So uh, the other thing that we find for the antimony tin system is uh, that that volume expansion is mediated as you go through more cycles. And so, let me get rid of that. Um, and so for the 36th cycle, the overall area expansion is much less, but um, the changes in pore system are very similar. Okay, so what's our general rule? How do you make things harder? You go from, ah, oh, thank you. Save me from myself. Yeah, yeah, see, it's because every time I give a talk, I'm like, you know, someday I should recharge this thing, and then I never do, and I'm like, someday it's going to stop working in the middle of a talk, and then it did. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, okay, so we can go from lithium to sodium. For the tin, with sodium, the capacity really fades pretty rapidly. We have significant capacity fade in just 100 cycles. For the antimony tin, we see much better behavior with sodium, with only a modest capacity fade over 100 cycles. And I should say sodium is not so easy. So while this may not seem like a great system, uh, this is pretty good behavior for uh, sodium in an alloy type anode. Um, so if we look at these materials, what we find is that indeed, if we look at the pores, with sodium, there is some pore breakage, but it is significantly less. Um, than what we saw with um, pure tin. But it's certainly not what we see with lithium where we actually see the pores decrease. We do see some pore breakage which corresponds to an increase in average pore area. So how can we mitigate that? Well, one thing that people often do in the literature is that they use an oxide coating to help stabilize the material. And so we tried this. We used ALD alumina as a way to try to stabilize these materials. When we do that, we find that the overall area expansion indeed decreases. And now when we look at the pores, we actually see that the pores are really well preserved. So the overall pore expansion that corresponds to the breakage is much, much smaller. Okay? So we can stabilize these materials even against pore breakage um, in, with sodium in the antimony, combining antimony tin with surface coatings. So just the last point here is that 
Uh, one of the reasons that we really think the structures are different in these materials is that in a bulk material, they have to lithiate from the outside in. And so in terms of contrast in tixum, you see a lithiated phase that then propagates in. In these materials, the contrast, which corresponds to the lithium content, homogeneously fades across the entire material. And so we don't have the strain that is associated with this core shell structure. And we think that that's a lot of the increased stability in these materials. Okay, mini conclusions number two. Nanoporous metals with ideal architectures can give you high capacity, mechanical flexibility is the key, and intermetallic phases can be used to stabilize pores along with surface coatings. Okay, so I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna really fast go through the last part because for the magnetics people here, and you have a really great magnetics uh, group, I wanna just briefly show you what these same nanoporous materials can do for multiferroics. So for those of you who are not familiar with multiferroics, um, these are materials that couple ferroelectricity and magnetism so that an electric field can be used to modify the magnetic state of the material. There are a few intrinsic multiferroics, basically one, and after you've written a few papers on bismuth ferrite, you're bored and you need something else. But there is an infinite variety of composite multiferroics. And the idea of a composite multiferroic is that you take a piezoelectric that will change shape on application of an electric field. You take a magnetostrictive ferromagnet, which is a magnet where the spin orientation is sensitive to strain, and you glue them together so that when you strain the piezoelectric, when you uh, actuate the piezoelectric, it strains the magnetic phase and it changes the spin orientation. So people have made thin film versions of this where they put uh, magnetostrictive metals on top of piezoelectrics and they have moved the spins from right to left and up to down in every possible direction. Um, uh, we would like to look at nanostructured materials and ask particularly how nanoscale architecture can help control multi coupling. Okay, so there's a whole world where people make composite multi and they do this usually by co-sputtering a uh, piezoelectric phase like barium titanate or bismuth ferrite is also often used just as a good ferroelectric just forgetting its complicated magnetic properties, or cobalt ferrite, and they co-sputter them, and when they're immiscible, you just spontaneously get sort of a nanoscale mixture of your ferroelectric and your magnetostrictive ferromagnet. And in these systems, if you bias them, you can strain the ferroelectric, and you can um, change the magnetization. But the challenge in these systems is that they're thin films, and they're always clamped to the substrate. And so the strain is inhibited by the fact that everybody is chemically bonded to the same flat surface that is not moving anywhere. So the question that we wanted to ask is, can we use the same chemistry that I've showed you a couple of times where we put holes in things as a way to start to alleviate that substrate clamping effects? So what do we do? We make nanoporous versions of um, uh, spinel ferromagnet, cobalt ferrite. We also have a bunch of piezoelectrics, but I'm not gonna show that data here for just time considerations. So we can make nanoporous versions of a magnetostrictive ferromagnet, and we can make very homogeneous porosity, and we can tune the domain size just by how hot we heat it, and the pores stay quite stable. And then the beautiful thing that we're going to do is we're going to fill the pores with a piezoelectric using atomic layer deposition. And this is all in collaboration with Jane Chang's group in chemical engineering at UCLA, and they are experts in the ALD method. And so they've developed ways to put down, for example, PZT using a complicated set of lead, titanium, and zirconium cycles. Um, and the idea of ALD is that you take and you put in, if you have a surface with, say, hydroxyl groups, you put in a reactive metal precursor, it reacts in a self-limiting way with those hydroxyl groups, and then you sweep out the reactant, and then you put in water, which can reactivate the surface, and you repeat. And so you fill pores from the outside in, and you do not block the pores. So you make a conformal layer on the surface, and you can choose how much you fill the pores. Okay, so we can make PZT CFO composites. Here's a picture before deposition and after deposition in SEM. And then you can do some <coughs> electron energy loss TEM and you can see that indeed where the cobalt and iron are is where the lead, zirconium, and titanium are not. So we have a clean composite material. And the beauty is we decide how much to fill it. So if we want to leave a lot of residual porosity, we can make a very thin layer of PZT. And if we want to leave not so much residual porosity, we can make a thicker layer of PZT. Problem is, if we make a thin layer of PZT, we have not so much ferroelectric to strain the system, okay? So that seems like it might be bad. 
Um, here's just some characterization. Here's some SEM images of the tops of the films. And this is uh, porous symmetry looking at the residual porosity. So as formed, our films are about 25% porous. With three nanometers of ALD, they go down to about 15% porous. Six nanometers, about 5% porous. And 10 nanometers, they are absolutely sealed. Um, what we're doing now, and I've talked to your magnetics group about ways to do this far better because this is a very simplistic experiment. What we're doing is we're just taking the whole film and we're pulling it in a gap electrode. Um, we use a very high applied voltage so that we have a modest field on the sample. We have a giant potential drop in our gap. But then we can pull the entire film and we can take it out and we can do diffraction or put it in our squid magnetometer. So it's super easy, um, not probably the most efficient. And we can look at the magnetization either out of the plane or in the plane. Um, so if we just look at squid curves and if we look at the magnetization in the plane, if we look at something that's filled or half filled as a function of applied field, nothing changes because in plane everything is absolutely clamped to the substrate and nothing can move. If we look perpendicular to the plane, however, now we see something very different, which is when the pores are fully filled, there's almost no change in the magnetization. But as we go to less and less PZT, we start to see that there is a dramatic change in magnetization as we apply an electric field to this system. And the biggest changes come when we have the smallest amount of PZT and the most residual porosity. So we said, are we really getting strain transfer in these systems? So we went to our friendly neighborhood synchrotron and we said, can we look at the strain transfer using diffraction? So the cobalt ferrite framework is really easy to see. We have a bunch of peaks, powder diffraction. The PZT is not very crystalline and there's not very much of it. So we have one little peak. We can barely track the PZT, but we can look at it. And what we find is indeed for the PZT, we do have compressive in-plane strain and tensile out-of-plane strain as we expect. But the more interesting thing is that if we now look at the materials as a function of pore filling, what we find, this is magnetization change from squid magnetometry, and this is despacing change. These are very little um, values. What you see is they track. When you have a lot of magnetization change, you also have a lot of strain transfer. And when you have almost no magnetization change, you also have almost no strain transfer. And so indeed, the thinner layer of PZT is changing the lattice constant of the cobalt ferrite more than the thicker layer. And what that says is residual porosity and the mechanical flexibility that it brings is the most important aspect in this multi coupling. Okay, this is one system. You might say, yeah, is this real? Is this actually a general phenomena? So we said, okay, let's go from PCT to bismuth ferrite. I said bismuth ferrite is actually multi but it's anti-ferromagnetic, and really it's actually just a very well-behaved piezoelectric, better behaved than PCT in many cases. And so the chain group can also do atomic layer deposition of bismuth ferrite, and so we can deposit that in our pores. Now we can actually get PE loops for the... Um, composite material, which we really couldn't get decent stuff for the PZT. So we can see the polarization for the um, ALD BFO inside CFO. And now this is SEM again. You can see um, here is the bare pores. When it's half filled, you see some small pores. And when it's fully filled, you see that there's no pores left on top. Um, and now what we see is the same trend, but much more dramatic. So um, with 100% filling, there's very little change in the magnetization. But as we go to 25% filled, we see over a 50% change in magnetization as we bias the system with an electric field. And so adding residual porosity with a better ferroelectric does even more good because that mechanical flexibility really allows the system to distort and respond to the piezoelectric-induced strain. And again, we can go to the synchrotron. As you see, we have a really lousy signal to noise here. But generally speaking, the fully filled system shows less strain change than the half filled system. OK, so my final mini conclusion is to say I hope I've showed you that nanoporous materials are not only useful for batteries, they are also interesting building blocks for multi furrow multi composites. And that combining polymer templating of sol gel precursors with atomic layer deposition is a really different but I think interesting way to build these composites with controlled architecture and tunable residual porosity. And interesting, 
materials with the least ferroelectric material, which should have the least ability to pull on the magnetic phase, actually show the largest multi froic coupling, illustrating the role of porosity and mechanical flexibility in multi -froics. And that's just not something that the community has really thought about because it's almost all vacuum deposition and vacuum deposition does not create porosity. Okay, so let me end by thanking the people who did all this work. I didn't do any of it. I have a phenomenal group of students and a postdocs and a phenomenal group of collaborators. Um, so uh, let's start with the first project on pseudocapacitors. Uh, we have a great pseudocapacitor group in, in my group, including students present and past, and I want to particularly call out um, Terry Lin, John Cook, Ben LaSalle, and Yan Yan for mo doing most of the work that I showed you today. Uh, my partner in crime for all of our pseudocapacitor work is Bruce Dunn in material science, and that work was funded by the Department of Energy, who is our savior for energy storage work. The high volume change anodes um, was again also done by Terry Lynn, and um, what the whole uh, D-alloyed porous metals was started in my group by Eric Detsy, who's currently a professor at um, uh, UPenn, and he's doing great stuff, so I urge you to look out for his work, um, and also uh, um, Andrew Dawson, and then now being continued by Joe Masiati. And this work uh, is funded by the DOE as part of our EFRC scaler, and I really want to call out uh, Dr. Johanna Nelson at SSRL, who taught us everything we know about Tixum. We just said, wow, that looks cool. Can you teach us how to do it? So everything we know about Tixum, we really owe to Johanna. Uh, and then finally, oops. Finally, um, our multi work is part of an NSF-funded ERC engineering research center called TAMS, Translational Application of Nanoscale multi Systems. Um, and that work was done mostly by Abraham Buditama and uh, Tai Karaba, and Jane Chang was a key collaborator, and as I said, NSF funded it. And lastly, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Stephen was called, uh, have a phone call, so uh, asked me to uh, be an MC for questions. So the floor is open. Can't be so clear that nothing was confusing. Yes, Molly. actually the confusing thing, and we have some data that I didn't show because I don't fully understand it. So it's well established that a plateau means you have two-phase coexistence. The sort of more S-shaped or sloping voltage profile is generally associated with solid solution, second-order type phase transitions. We have nanoscale systems where we make them smaller and smaller, and we see them go from first-order phase transition to second-order phase transition to less structural change overall. So the distinction between a first order phase transition and a second order phase transition is clear. But we also see size effects from second order phase transition to suppression of structural change. And that's really what we're currently trying to understand. Um, and that ties into the work I showed you on LVPF, which is to say lithium ion diffusion and phase transition diffusion are not necessarily, they can be the same thing, those diffusion constraints, but they don't have to be. Um, so what I would say is when we are trying to make nanoscale pseudocapacitors, we often start with those materials that already show solid solution behavior, so those S-shaped curves, and then try to make them small. Because in theory, all we have to do is dif reduce the diffusion lengths to get really good pseudocapacitive behavior, and we don't have to worry about suppressing the phase transitions. But I would say the jury is still out on exactly where those borders lie. Okay. Thanks. All right, great talk. I don't want, I don't want with, with the battery, but like, I'm just going to this very interesting. Uh, just have a question on your, uh, you mentioned porous metallic system, where you get back to cracking, like mm -hmm. coating. Side. 
how does the that work? Does the lithium diffuse through the oxide layer? So, okay, there's a reason I only spent one slide on it, because there's a lot that we don't understand. So, um, uh, so if you make the alumina very thin and then you cycle it with lithium, it's been shown that you can make a lithium aluminate that is a modestly good lithium ion conductor. So the lithi the, uh, it's not a great lithium ion conductor. So you have to start with really thin alumina, just a couple of nanometers. And then the conductivity of the lithium aluminate that you can generate by in situ lithiation seems to be good enough that you can still get lithium through. What we don't really know is to what extent the alumina is coating the outer surface of the grain versus the entire inner surface. So if it's coating the outer surface, it's just mechanically stabilizing the whole grain. If it's coating the inner surface, it's stabilizing the whole pore system. And we really don't know that yet, which is why I gave it exactly one slide, because I, I feel slightly uncomfortable with the data. But what I showed you is clearly true. The pores break less with that alumina coating. Um, and we don't see that the pores are significantly smaller, so we think it's actually coating the grain and just providing some mechanical stabilization. But the lithium aluminate is, is okay for getting um, lithium through. We also, with Jane Chang's group, have made some lithium aluminosilicate lasso, which is a better lithium ion conductor, but the results are similar with the alumina and the lasso. So it doesn't seem that lithium ion conductivity through the surface coating is really rate limiting. Any more questions? If not, uh, let's thank Professor Tolbert again.